<laughs> the first golden age of cannabis pharmaceutical medicines, 1830 to 1937. Sure. So I'm closing out a 50-year career as a cannabis advocate, attorney, early pioneer of the hemp industry, and early developer of cannabis pharmaceuticals. Our work has resulted in the creation of Sativex and Epidiolex prescription drugs that are being released to the world now, made of cannabis. And throughout this work, I was always challenged by people who told me cannabis was not ever a mainstream medicine in the United States. And I set out to prove this wrong. So I collected what is America's largest collection of these purloined objects. All of these objects you're going to see were illegal from 1937 on. Every museum, every collector, every library got rid of their objects, their books. They wanted to wipe this subject out of American memory. And they just about succeeded. But this stuff survived on the shelves of pharmacists and physicians who kept their cabinets of curiosities and felt like they were above the law and they could do this. So this history was preserved by a few heroes. Now this stuff is very fragile and we've become photographers to display this because it's just too hard to carry around. So here in a nutshell is my history of the use of cannabis medicines in the United States. Let's see, okay. So this starts with hemp seeds and hemp seed oil. This is the 1830s era hand blown jar, you know, with the metal cap, it's very typical of the era, with the gold uh, leaf label. And this was the display of the time, it was high tech, and it really was attractive to people because glass was so rare and expensive. This is a big five gallon carboy made a few, you know, 30 or 40, 50 years later when they got coal furnaces and better manufacturing processes, but it's still blown into a single piece mold. Cannabis was an herb used very extensively in the early days of the apothecary. The physician would write out an order and the apothecary would fill it. And the apothecary didn't have the modern tools of today. This was the bane of any apothecary student. You had to know this cabinet and the 200 different herbs that were put into these boxes. You had to be able to pick it up by that little handle and smell through that little hole what the herb was and identify it. And this was all they had in terms of quality control. And they had to be really good at it to differentiate these different herbs. This changed in the beginning of the 19th century when hashish came in from Asia and was determined to be a new miracle medicine. Originally in 16, 1753, Linnaeus defined cannabis sativa. And 32 years later, Landmark discovered the Asian variety and realized it was way different and named it cannabis indica. And for many years, the pharmacies kept these two apart. We have Almost 50 examples of sets where sativa and indica were separated and differentiated by the apothecaries. So this is a very early hand blown set, as is this. This is obviously a German set. Uh, the substance on the right being seeds. Uh, <laughs> uh, another old set. But if we could do this over and over again. These are when bottles began to be more uniformly manufactured, the apothecaries were still labeling them themselves. So this is two different apothecaries, both differentiating sativa and indica. Milk glass jars in sativa and indica. Then about 1870, they had problems because these two really weren't different varieties. They were separated by 10 or 20 or 50,000 years of human intervention but they easily interbred. And so once they brought the indica plants to America, they lost their parental stock. And it's kind of complicated to explain, but uh, THC genetics and CBG, CBD genetics are the genetics for the antagonist and the agonist of the receptor. And 
that are codominant with each other. So you have plants that have the CBD genetics, you have plants that have the THC genetics. When you combine them, you're going to get a plant that has one gene of T for THC, one gene for CBD, and you've got a mosh. You've got a mix of the two. And so cannabis in the 1870s developed a reputation for being an unreliable medicine. And apothecaries would use these inverted apothecaries to put it on the counter so customers could see they really did have two different kinds of, of, of cannabis. And it became more complex because the hybrid was recognized as having its own value. When you get the agonist and the antagonist together, you're getting the effects of the ag um, agonist without some of the side effects. And so they named this cannabis Americana, and eventually uh, it became a, the mostly distributed thing. But here's an old set of horizontal apothecaries that has the indica, sativa, and the Americana together. And this is quite common. We have several sets where they were featuring all three types. Park Davis and Eli Lilly, they spent a lot of money. Eli Lilly, this was his thing. And, and putting out cannabis Americana. And this now proves true in science. This is work that um, Porter Farm did. And it shows the three states of cannabis. You've got THC varieties, you've got mixed varieties, and you've got CBD varieties with a small amount of THC. And this is 99% of the cannabis fits into one of these three varieties. So when they had three varieties in the stores, they had it nailed. They knew quite a bit about it. Here's one of my favorite jars. This is that hand blown into a wooden mold, single piece wooden mold jar from probably 1830 or 40 t-shirt. This was probably British. And this became the standard use of cannabis. Tinctures were in every store. They used them in formulas of many kinds. And the problem with the, this is that once you concentrate cannabis so much, it becomes not toxic, but it becomes enough to make someone sick and, and overdose. And so they began to use these green poison jars to show the apothecary that even in a back room or a dark basement, he can differentiate this and not give a, uh, dispense something wrongly that would have been dangerous for somebody. You know, our favorite set of these blue apothecaries. And, uh, Understand, they've got the tincture, the syrup, the elixir, and the fluid extract. And we see this over and over and over again in our sets. The tincture would have been a raw product, just alcohol and cannabis soaked for a while. And that does not give you THC. It gives you the acidic form of THC, which is not bioactively available. So you could feed the tincture to a child and not worry about a side effect. But if you boiled it down for a couple hours with sugar, then it became very powerful and if you added extra herbs and spices, you, every apothecary had their own elixir formula. Or if you boil out the alcohol, you've got a thick treacle-like substance that's very similar to what people are using today to treat themselves for cancer. Notice the hand-painted acanthus leaves on these labels. They really took a lot of time with this because in, these era, in this era, they thought they were going to use these for a thousand years. This is a little doctor's set. Again, the syrup extract, the mixer, and the uh, tincture. So they understood decarboxylation, even though they didn't understand the chemistry behind it and the different ways that cannabis could be dispensed. Here's a set from South America, uh, extract Kanyo in the middle. I think it's interesting that Kibrach at the end was the original remedy for uh, malaria. They wiped it out South America in a few short years and had to find a substitute with the culture scene. Here's a set from Mexico. Here's a, you know, some, some really good sets here. You know, again, to have the sativa and the America, Americana. This one's got the sativa, indica, Americana extract and seeds. And our best set has got the sativa, America, indica, indica seeds, hashish, tincture, syrup, and extract. That's my kind of drugstore. This is about 1890. This is the end though of the apothecary era. And they went to these fancy apothecaries because it wasn't selling out of class and they started doing these Boston rounds, Boston squirrels, and, and other kinds of fancy class thinking it might sell better. But 
At the same time, the manufacturing that Richard was talking about and all these capabilities were pushing out the apothecary in favor of prepackaged drugstores. But it first came in the form of patent medicines. Anybody with the wagon could be putting these things out on the street. But it was unregulated and became quite a problem because of the health claims that were being made on the products and the fact that they were putting heroin and cocaine in products and causing addiction without putting it on the label. And so we got the regulations of 1906 and 1913, which changed the apothecary. The apothecaries themselves were quite concerned because these bottles could get reused and people were selling imitations and all. So they took to embossing their bottles. And the one on the right is Dr. James. It's the only bottle we know that actually says cannabis in the embossing. The bottle on the left is Tilden's, which was quite popular at the time because the original um, book about cannabis recommended it. Uh, lots of great things. Here's the beginning of the Menon's Corporation. Here's the beginning of the Johnson & Johnson Corporation. They were into these cannabis plasters quite a bit in their early years. See Barry and Johnson, that's how they started. This is, this is its use as a topical. They understood that cannabis, they could watch cannabis poultices work on cancer, skin cancers, and warts, and bunions. And it's amazing, and they, so there's over 100 brands we've collected of these foot cures. Homeopathics, cannabis is an important part of homeopathic medicine. Here's the Humphreys kit, and it used cannabis in its set. Then we've got Lily. You know, Lily graduated from the Philadelphia School of Pharmacy in 1906 with a dissertation on breeding cannabis using dogs because he was so concerned about the mosh that cannabis had become, and he was he spent much of his career working in northern Indiana trying to create better genetics so the cannabis could be restored to the pharmacy in its original form. So this is our little collection of Lily jars. The company denies this history, and so we're putting it in their face of more than that. Now we're getting into the second part, you know, 1910, 1920. With the laws changing, the pharmacy had to get much more professional, and you're seeing the major pharmaceutical companies of the day taking up cannabis as their as a cure. <coughs> Every major drug company was doing it, and we've got examples of pretty much all of them. This is Park Davis selling cannabis for smoking in the 10s and 20s and 30s. It was quite popular. It was 10 cents for one of these little boxes you see there, which was much cheaper than tobacco and became the smoking choice for lower classes, and which led to its downfall. But it was definitely smoked. It was definitely used as an herb and teas and sold that way by many drugstores. It was used in asthma cures. This is, the one on the left is Grimalt's, which is the only one of asthma cures that says it's cannabis in the cup. But they all, it was present in most all of these asthma cures, asthma cigarettes that were sold well into the 50s. And you can understand it works. That when you try to take a drug for asthma, when you're choking and having trouble breathing, you need something that's going to give you instant relief. And smoking is, was, until they came up with albuterol, the, the drug of choice. Um, it was used quite a bit as an analgesic and a neurologic. You know, here's Wyeth Brothers putting out different strengths of cannabis as a neuropathic, neurologic, neuropathic. It was sold and recommended for the cessation of opium habits. They understood this 100 years ago. There's people trying to patent this right now. It works very well. You have soldiers, you know, and, and the veterans associations pushing this as a solution to our current opium crisis. And this is anything that we didn't understand 100 years ago. Here's another example of it from Lilly and from um, the Lloyd Brothers in Cincinnati. All of them toting cannabis as the, the way to go. This is a collection of Lloyd jars. I'm going fast. Here's, this is like 1920 in the area of diphtheria, consumption, tuberculosis. They, 
uh, do a lot of sick children, and so cannabis worked its way to a lot of cough medicines for children and must have been providing them a lot of relief because they're quite popular. As an aphrodisiac, uh, it was sold quite readily by major drug companies, Eli Lilly and Upjohn in this case. This is 1937, when cannabis was at the edge. They had modernized it. Notice the screw top jars. Notice the proper label of ingredients. The batch control numbers and the box and the warning labels and all these things. This was a modern medicine. And cannabis could have survived in the drugstore except for ugly politics that was used to take it down. It wasn't just cannabis that was being attacked at the time. All the herbs were being attacked in the drugstores. They, there was an effort from the Rockefeller Foundation on down to try to make it so only patented medicines would be in the drugstores. And cannabis was one of the first victims of this program. And a lot of propaganda. This is 1937 when cannabis was denigrated to the point that cannabis banned it. Despite the objections of the American Medical Association saying that cannabis was used in 25,000 different products and it wasn't being a problem, Congress got persuaded to ban it anyway. And then you had the 1950 era propaganda that reinforced all these stereotypes about cannabis. And this is why this stuff is so hard to find. Everybody was afraid of it through this whole era. Nobody wanted to have it on their shelves or even their bookshelves. So, here, here's one more for you. This is one of my favorites. This is the Columbus Pharmacal Company that put out early medicines, and they evolved and evolved and evolved. And then for 30 years, they put out Marinol out of Columbus Island. The same company evolved into Roxanne. And they were the source of the medical marijuana in America for 30 some years until the modern movement has surpassed it. We're putting on shows around the country, decorating dispensaries. We've created a non-profit profit organization. Our first job was to put all of this in a big database. This database is available to researchers now. It's my primary purpose for coming here. If people want to study this, we've got the data for you. It's fresh, it's new, and nobody's going to scoop your story here. <laughs> um, this is Liz Probes. Uh, my assistant here has and, and four others have been working on trying to create a cannabis museum out of this. We're more concerned about the doing it from the inside out than the outside in. We don't know where it's going to be, but we're going to have it ready for somebody else crazy enough to go to go in for it. Um, uh, this is my crew, and I'm open for any questions. So, thank you. Questions. I'll start with Craig. Yes, I was just wondering, are you accepting artifacts? We'd love them. Okay. In, in any kind of memorabilia, because it's, it's not just this. This is the, the part that gets the attention, but we're collecting the history of the textiles, we're collecting the history of the prohibition against cannabis, and the movement that restored cannabis to our formularies. We had a question over here. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, you mentioned Grimaud and Company, which is the cigarette company from France that actually started in the 1860s and made cigarettes uh, for asthma with cannabis all the way up until the 1930s, as far as I found. Um, have you found any other sources or uh, paraphernalia from France or specifically uh, uh, Europe in general? Because uh, from my research, and I also know Jim Mills has done a lot of research on this, uh, the earlier technologies of, for instance, tincture were being developed in the 1830s in Britain as well as in France. So I'm yeah. just curious if you had any in your collections. We have several Grimaud advertisements, but that's, I think, all that I can help you with out of Europe. They were extensively advertising around the world. Uh, I saw a couple other hands. Yeah. Uh, Don, you, you mentioned um, some of the very earliest um, uh, artifacts. Um, and can you put a date on them? Because I'm very conscious that cannabis medicines don't really appear in the UK uh, until the 1840s. That's about right. I'm, I'm going 1830 for these hemp drives okay. that were, you know, European and you know, part of the apothecary from the beginning. That early settlers used it for growth, but they also would take the roots and use it for arthritis. So, yeah, but as a, as a 
the whole idea of having these packaged the, the pharmacies and all this really blew up after the Revolutionary War when the supply of medicines were cut off from England and it increased, you know, in the early part of the 19th century to the point where by the Civil War these apothecary <coughs> shops were in every village. Okay. Richard. Uh Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Last one. Then. Um, this is a very quick one. I've noticed that some of the bottles that have some of the bottles of cannabis were these uh, were these actually distinctive uh, categories, or were they used interchangeably? And was cannabis something they picked up as a branding thing? Because now it's a legal distinction. Yeah. But was that the case over 100 years ago? No, hemp was hemp. It was referring to the seeds and fiber, low THC varieties in the early days, and cannabis was. The most generalized term used for anything to do with medicine is cannabis, and we don't see a single example of the use of marijuana before the propaganda started in the 20s. Great, thank you very much.